Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome back to the Ketogenic Fasting Project. This is number 19, and today I'm talking about a book called The Plant Paradox. The Plant Paradox is a, basically a diet book written by a doctor, and uh, it may sound like something that's outside of the ketogenic fasting sort of world and and that's because it is um, I try to, uh, you know people who uh, who I talk to will know that I try not to um, live in a bubble you know just because I'm a big fan of the ketogenic uh, diet and fasting doesn't mean that's the only thing I I uh, look into or study you know, I try to, I realize a lot of people get stuck in like an echo chamber and, you know, they only consume information or talk to people that agree with them or maybe they have a lot of adversarial relationships with people where they're just constantly arguing or whatever, but it's really kind of the same thing, right? So I like to consider the other possibilities. I, I often thought that, you know, not only does this need to be individualized, but that as time progressed, we'd find out more information. You know, there would be more technology or more methods or more science that'd be incorporated to improve the ketogenic uh, diet. And of course, it's not the only diet. It's not the only thing that's gonna work for everybody. In fact, it's not gonna work for some people, I'm, I'm sure. I don't know exactly who. I mean, uh, certainly I wouldn't recommend fasting to growing children. Uh, unless they, there was some reason, you know, maybe their doctor would or, you know, and probably not pregnant women probably shouldn't be on it. Um, and certainly type 1 diabetics need special consideration if they do ketogenics uh, because of their situation. But, uh, you know, there's probably other exceptions out there, too, that are beyond uh, imagination at the moment. But uh, I, uh, I like to consider the possibilities, you know, and I think everybody should trust their own ability to to ascertain things and compare things. And the only way you can really keep comparing things is to con keep consuming information. You know, don't reject stuff without thoughtful consideration. So, you know, books like uh, The Plant Paradox or How Not to Die you know, and uh, a couple other of the vegetarian vegan books are definitely on my radar. And of course, being vegetarian or vegan doesn't necessarily mean you can't do a ketogenic diet because there are, in fact, uh, vegans that do it. There's there is definitely Facebook groups dedicated to it. I'm not sure about a, a book, but there probably is one out there. And if there is, I'll, I'll eventually probably read it. So. Uh, the Plant Paradox is a book that's been out for a little while now. It's by Dr. Gundry, and uh, it's a it's a good book. It's well done. It's you know it's a professional effort. So um, at the very least, you know you're not you're not wasting your time with something that's hard to understand or makes no sense at all. You know the book definitely has value, and it's worth picking up. Yeah, the book uh, in Dr. Gundry's sort of philosophy or approach to everything basically revolves around lectins and omega-6 fatty acid, but mostly lectins. He talks about lectins in food and the effect that lectins have on the body, um, particularly the lining of the digestive tract, which uh, in itself is of interest to me. I mean, whether you're going to go on a plant-based diet or not, you do, there are a lot of foods that have lectins and a lot of them are foods that people have known issues with above and beyond what uh, people uh, might debate about uh, leaky gut syndrome. I mean, there's some people out there, you hear doctors or whatever say that they don't think leaky gut even exists, but I'm obviously in the camp where I'm pretty sure it does. I mean, I haven't done any science, but I, it's, it's one of those things in my own estimation that's at the acceptable level of anecdotal evidence and uh, it's been studied and you know and all that so and of course omega-6 fatty acids there tends to be an overabundance of them in our in our diet so they and at those levels they tend to be 
they tend to cause inflammation in the body, which is one of the reasons why you want to be on a ketogenic diet is reduce inflammation because a lot of diseases stem from inflammation in the body, like especially like heart disease. But of course, joint pain and arthritis and all that, like something I've suffered from is definitely an issue. So aside from having too many carbohydrates and having too much high blood sugar, you can cause inflammation by, by uh, uh, methods like uh, consuming lectins and too much omega-6 fatty acid. So like I said, it, it's definitely worth reading. Um, it's valuable in terms of its knowledge. And uh, I will, uh, I'm going to sit down and, and pencil out uh, the diet and what it would take. And I might actually consider trying it just to see what happens. I mean, I like to say you got to be your own best doctor and your own best guinea pig. Because um, I, I, I truly believe fitness and uh, uh, diet have to be individualized, you know. I've, I've said before, I think that, you know, there's a potential within human beings to to live naturally for probably 120 years as long as your nutrition is good you know and your fitness is reasonable i think we can do it and 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 it's science may well extend it beyond that you know it's entirely possible there's all kinds of stuff right around the corner you know stem cells are getting faster and cheaper and easier to produce and there's more and more therapies available and there's more and more known about what's going on inside us and why we deteriorate. So anyways, uh, all that science aside, I think through diet and exercise, we might be able to have a hundred healthy flourishing years, you know, not that I want to linger for the last 20 of that 120, but I think uh, there's, there's lessons to be learned even in diets that aren't necessarily going to work for most people or aren't desirable for most people. Uh, you know, there's some obvious flaws. Uh, I think anybody who who uh, starts writing a book based on a philosophy, I'm sure this doctor had good success and helped patients, but he basically, you know, in his eyes, lectins are the evil that caused all the modern problems with typical American diet, you know, the sad diet or the Western diet. You know, there's a lot of focus on that in spite of the fact that uh, diabetes has a long record around the world, you know, somehow it's the American diet that's the problem, which I'm not saying the typical American diet is a, a great diet, but I think focusing on, on it in those terms is kind of uh, a disservice because there's more to be considered, you know. Um, his romance of the plant diet, you know, it's not a strict plant diet. He talks about eating fish and uh, shellfish and stuff like that, you know, uh, and reducing protein. You know, it makes it sound as though everybody just eats a, an insane amount of protein, and that's part of the problem as well. But I don't really see that uh, as being quite as as uh, good an explanation as he makes it out to be. I mean, he talks about the ketogenic diet being a high protein diet when it's deliberately a moderate protein diet. So right there, and he, talk, he, he mentions that kind of in passing, but he, he picks on the paleo diet a lot. And as we, anybody who knows much about anything about the paleo diet is, it's been bastardized in so many directions. It's, it's, hard, it's uh, hard to find its origin. Right, and if this is really, really about uh, ancestral health, uh, um, which he doesn't necessarily claim, but uh, one would think that our ancestors are were ate what was available, and our bodies developed based on on uh, what they ate for thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. So his diet is quite quite divergent. He does make some distinguish, distinguish, uh, uh, distinguishing marks between new world foods like corn and potatoes and tomatoes and all that stuff. And how a lot of us really don't have the genes for that, which, which does make sense, but uh, the preparation of the foods like beans and tomatoes and stuff like that too um and and you know he, he did point out one thing I, I i i am sure i read it in a textbook as a child that peanuts originally came from 
Africa, but they don't. They they come from Central America, you know, which which really raised my eyebrow. It's like it's one of those things, you know, you got to unlearn <laughs> unlearn some things. So, uh, you know, perhaps peanuts uh, really really are not a, a food that we we are adjusted to eat. And of course, it's not really a nut. It's a legume. And like a lot of the legumes, they're high in lectins. Um, he conveniently ignores data. He just basically says that the, that the, the consensus is in and uh, high protein diets are out. And, you know, he talks about the Catawbans who live on a a uh, tuber based uh, diet that's primarily uh, taro root, which that's just one culture that does it. And, and I'm not saying they can't do it or they don't do it or I couldn't do it, but he completely ignores a lot of the examples of like the Maasai, which still are a cattle based society. They drink cow blood and whole milk and eat beef, you know. And of course, we we've got the Inuits, or what are we commonly known as the Eskimos, and in other cultures that eat very little. Uh, you know, I think the number is something like six percent of their diet comes from plants, which is very small. So, and he he kind of ignores all that and just says, "Well, we got the Catawbans," which it's like, "Well, you got the Catawbans, and and who else? Who else has been doing it for thousands of years?" And of course, they eat a resistant starch, which is kind of a subcategory in in uh, ketogenics but you know re, you know even gorillas when they eat 16 pounds of vegetation their colons converted into fatty acids and they don't actually doesn't actually go into their fuel system as carbohydrate it goes in as fat which kind of leads us back to the ketogenic concept uh he doesn't really cite very many studies he and he talks a lot about about trace chemicals and stuff uh you know it's like oh you know you're gonna get this from that and it's gonna kill you basically and he talks about all kinds of of uh he, he even implies that uh, meat causes diabetes so I, you know and and heart disease and everything so i at that point uh, you know what i believe and what he believes are are divergent he also talks a lot about detox and cleanse and all these crazy supplements and extracts. Um, the food plan sounds expensive um, and, and clearly not ancestrally based. So, you know, all those are negatives in my mind. I'd like to uh, sit down and pencil out a budget to see what it would take to eat his diet for a month or maybe two months something like that and like i said i i'd like to give it a try i i think experiments like this are absolutely fascinating and you don't know till you know you know i uh i could be completely wrong and maybe he's right but a lot of the stuff he he uh he suggests in the book don't make any sense i mean if you're on a good diet you should not need antacids and stuff like that you know so i know when i went keto all the many many years of heartburn are gone i rarely have it now um so anyways i'm gonna wrap this one up to keep it short and there'll probably be another report on this book down the road probably compare it with something else but I would like to thank everybody for listening and I hope this helps somebody and uh, please help me out by subscribing to my YouTube channel. Thank you very much.